acara kita. Jadi uh, selamat siang rekan-rekan semua, selamat datang, selamat terima kasih telah menyempatkan waktunya di siang ke sore hari ini kita ini adalah acara rutin dari komunitas kecil yang namanya masih Jasper's Club. Uh, acaranya kami membuat diskusi ilmiah mengenai metode penelitian, analisis data, uh, open science secara reguler. Dan saya tidak sendiri, saya ada tim kecil yang terdiri dari ada saya sendiri dari psikologi binus, sama saya Wisnu Miradani, saat ini saya dosen di Departemen Psikologi. Ada Pak Suno Bagaskara dari Psikologi Aksi dan ada Ibu Kristiani Suwartono atau biasa dipanggil Ibu Cencen dari Unika Atmajaya. Jadi Fakultas Psikologi juga. Jadi kita membuat acara reguler seperti ini. Uh, ditunggu hadirannya di acara-acara ini. Iya, Kadang-kadang iya, kalau kami sama gitu, iya, iya ki. Kalau kami rajin, kami bikinin sertifikat buat yang buat yang hadir. Kalau tidak, uh, ya semoga tetap bersedia untuk hadir. Ada Facebooknya dan ada media sosial yang lain. Nah, acaranya. Nah, untuk setahun ini setidaknya sudah kami plot. Ya, hari ini kita di 16 September 2022, kita kedatangan tamu yang sangat spesial. Bapak, oh, Bapak aneh juga ya. Uh, Profesor Erik Jan Wagenmakers dari uh, University of Amsterdam. Dia hari ini berbagi tentang JSP. Kalau sebelum-sebelumnya kita uh, yang pernah ikut acaranya sebelumnya sudah uh, ikut belajar tentang modul-modul JSP dan sebagainya. Hari ini kita kedatangan lead developernya JSP. Jadi beliau akan menjelaskan seluruh motivasinya kenapa dibuat JSP ini, lalu kenapa open source, kenapa free, dan untuk siapa, dan juga memberikan kesempatan nanti untuk rekan-rekan semua jika ingin bertanya atau bahkan mengusulkan saya mau ada modul ini di JSP demikian. Nah, bulan depan akan ada acara-acara yang berbeda lagi, jadi silakan ditunggu uh, dan diikuti si media sosial kami. Tadi sudah dibagikan oleh Mbak Cik. Begitu. Uh, ada panitianya masih bertambah. Kalau misalnya ibu bapak di sini, rekan-rekan ada yang tertarik untuk bergabung, kami sangat terbuka pun untuk um, memberikan kesempatan buat kita belajar bersama begitu. Oke, okay, I see that EJ has returned and I think he's ready to to share about just to, I'm not actually sure how <laughs> what's the, the official pronunciation of it. Uh, but he will talk uh, about this statistical program that we have been talking about over the last couple of months if you have been following us Uh, following this community, and uh, a bit of introduction. So, uh, Professor Eric Young Mogenmakers is a professor in methodology and statistics at the psychology department of the University of Amsterdam. And he is also the uh, lead developer of uh, Jeffrey's amazing statistical program, JASP, that uh, Chen and I and, uh, and Bugas have been using at our respective departments to teach and to analyze statistical data and to encourage our students to learn uh, statistics more. So, uh, Eric Jan, if you have heard about Bayesian statistic, uh, you most likely are, are already familiar with him. So the, his paper, the pervasive, the pervasive problems of p-values, I just checked earlier today has been cited uh, more than 2000 times. Uh, and now you realize that there are some problems with p-values. I, I don't know whether he wants to talk about it today. That's one of uh, the motivations of uh, the development of JASP, if, I, if, if I'm correct. But without further ado, I'll just uh, give the screen to, to Eric. Jan. So uh, before that, I, I'll just let everyone know. I'll be moderating this discussion. So uh, if you want to ask questions and you want to provide comments, you may do so by... Uh, raising your hands, uh, you can open your mics. You can write something on the chat if for some reason you are more comfortable to say something in Indonesian instead, I'll be happy to also translate for everyone. Then uh, I'll give the screen to EJ.
Thank you very much. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to uh, uh, to give a presentation on uh, on jazz. Um, it's a bit of an uh, unusual environment for me. Uh, I have a young child at home. Maybe you can hear her scream in the background. I'm in the attic upstairs uh, behind the computer of my wife. So if something doesn't quite work out, I can blame uh, my wife's computer in instead of my own clumsiness. Um, so uh, a large part of today is going to be me demonstrating uh, JASP to you. Um, and uh, I think today I'd like to focus on uh, one of our modules that we have created to teach students statistics. Um, that way we can also collect some data and analyze it as we go along. Um, but um, in the first part of the lecture, I would just like to introduce JASP, why it was built, uh, what its purpose is, uh, how you can help in the uh, sort of developing it further. Um, oh yes, of course, uh, if you feel free to interrupt me at any time, uh, we, we could have a discussion all the way at the end and you could just listen to me talk for an hour and a half straight or something. And, and I don't think that's a good idea. So uh, do interrupt me. Uh, I usually don't keep an eye on the chat as I'm speaking, uh, but Vishnu will probably uh, uh, be able to intervene when there's an interesting question uh, that cannot be immediately addressed uh, uh, in the chat itself. So without further ado, I'll share my screen and uh, we'll, we'll start with the, with the PowerPoint presentation and then we'll move to Yes. Oh, I also realized that there is like two hours reserved uh, of, of, for this. And um, that is kind of long to go through that in one sitting. So I propose that at, at a minimum, we'll have a short break somewhere in between maybe 10 minutes or so for a bathroom break or a coffee break or, or whatever uh, you need. We can do that. Uh, yeah, otherwise, I think uh, the information in the last half hour will just uh, yeah, not land the way it uh, uh, it, it, it could or it should. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Um, uh, there we go. So you see here a, uh, a, a wooden horse with the name Jasp on it, and it's actually a Trojan horse. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later, but uh, well, I can already tell you, like, of course, it's like, you see, it's an awesome program for classical statistics. You can download it for free. Absolutely no Bayesians inside, but of course there are Bayesians inside. And it's the, the idea is that it does both classical statistics. You know, you can get your p-values and your confidence intervals for very many popular statistical tests, tests in JASP, but we also do the Bayesian analysis. So this is a bit of a history of how it came to be. So in 2010, I applied for an uh, ERC grant from the European Research Council. And a close colleague uh, said, uh, apply for your dream project. And that's not necessarily a good thing to do when you apply for a grant, right? You also might wanna apply for a grant that you think you might get because the reviewers will be your friends and close colleagues and you'll get good reviews. But I, I did something completely different. I uh, proposed a project called Base or Bust and I wanted to develop JASP to bridge the gap between Bayesian theory and Bayesian practice, because I was a big fan of Bayes, but I realized that it's so easy for people to do classical statistics, and it's so difficult for them to do Bayesian statistics. So I wanted to e even level the playing field. And um, uh, that uh, project got granted, and then uh, it took off from there. And currently, the uh, development of JASP is supported by two large grants, another ERC grant and a Dutch uh, Fiji grant, which is also a large grant. Um, and we're currently engaging in collaborations with other universities uh, to keep going. And uh, the prospects are, uh, look very good. Uh, one of our big supporters is Utrecht University. And uh, throughout the years, they've already, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, so, uh, strongly supported us also financially. And, um, and we're looking to, uh, uh, to do this with other universities as well. And I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Um, there's also companies now using uh, JASP. Uh, there's a, a 
an international uh, that manufactures car parts, SKF. I had never heard of it, but they're, they're everywhere in the world. And um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if you can hear my kid scream. I, I can hear her very loudly, so it's a little bit distracting uh, <laughs> to me. Uh, there, there are doors closed in between. She shouts really loudly, so I, I hope it's not too disturbing uh, uh, for you. I'm sure she'll run out of energy soon. But anyway, uh, this company approached us because they were using Minitab, right? So what, what SPSS is for the social sciences is Minitab for companies. But Minitab is also very expensive. And so they approached us and said, uh, can't you add the kind of statistics that we need for our company? And then we can switch away from Minitab to JASP. And, and this is what we did. So uh, um, now they're all using JASP in that uh, international company. And we are doing the same thing with other companies as well. So uh, that's another way in which we hope to be able to continue our development in the future. And the UVA, uh, my university, the University of Amsterdam has also been very supportive. So currently we have three programmers and many part-time programmers, postdocs, PhD students, and students uh, who are helping out, and actually also people all around the world who, uh, who help out. So this gives you, uh, this is not accurate. Th these uh, specific people who work on JASP, some have already left, others have joined, but what is accurate is, a, is an overall idea of how many people are involved in, the, in a project like this. So it's a large project. And as you can see here, uh, JASP is, uh, offers both classical statistics, this is Ronald Fisher, and Bayesian statistics, Thomas Bayes over here. So uh, I'd like to uh, mention our core software engineers. This is uh, Bruno Boutin. He's uh, been with us for a long time. Uh, Joris Gossen, who's made tremendous contributions. Uh, Rens, who has uh, been with us for about a week um, and uh, 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 we'll see uh, uh, how things work out. But so far uh, uh, he's been doing uh, really, really great. Uh, we also have our chief technology officer, Alexander Lee and key contributors are Don van den Berg in his jazz shirt. I'm sorry, I'm not wearing it today. It's a little, little cold here. Uh, Simon Kucharski, Kuhn Dex, and Johnny van Doorn and Frantichek Bartos. Oh, I think we have a, a, a few more actually. Um, oh, by the way, I saw that you also uh, uh, had uh, a topic on meta-analysis with JASP. And I should say that Frantichek Bartos has done a lot of work on meta-analyses in JASP and particularly the Bayesian meta-analyses that he has uh, added is I would say state of the art. It does model averaging across a whole ensemble of different models instead of just picking one model and using that for your inference. So, I might uh, say a bit more about that later. Uh, Jonas Petter, uh, Keishan Fang. And uh, so that's just an, uh, a select overview of people who have uh, contributed a great deal. So as Vishnu already said, JASP stands for Jeffrey's Amazing Statistics Program in recognition of Asian pioneer Harold Jeffries. And it definitely never stood for just another statistics program. Okay, so the philosophy uh, behind JASP is that it is free, flexible, and friendly. So um, free in the sense, of course, that, um, uh, that the code is open source and that uh, you do, do not need to pay an expensive license. Flexible also in the sense that it offers both classical and Bayesian statistics, and friendly in the sense that the graphical user interface is inviting and attractive and easy to work with. And we work hard to keep it that way. So the, one of the problems with uh, statistics, with teaching it and uh, executing it is that there are two sort of main ways in which it's done and both have their disadvantages. So it's kind of, we're, kind of caught between Scylla and uh, Charybdis. So if you go to, uh, too much to the one side, bad things happen and too much to the other side, bad things happen as well. So you have to stay in the middle. So uh, on the one hand, 
we have popular software with a graphical user interface, such as SPSS or Minitab. But the downside is that these programs are often expensive, inflexible, and outdated. Um, and, and so, for instance, uh, the University of Amsterdam pays SPSS, I think it is 60,000 euros a year, so 60,000 euros a year for a campus license. Um, and, uh, and there's other costs uh, associated with it. For instance, a lot of people have problems with the installation, so then you need to have personnel to help those people out with the installation. Um, and the mini tab is in, in the same uh, uh, ballpark. But that would, I mean, that's bad. But what is also bad is if you, if, you, if you want something changed in SPSS, if you want a new analysis added, if you want a bug fixed or something, it can take a long time. It's not like you call IBM and somebody picks up the phone and says, okay, we'll, we'll change that for you. Uh, you wait a few months and the change has happened. So it's, uh, uh, and also the, the interface is just hasn't really been modernized as much as it should. But it does, I do think that in, at its core, those graphical user interfaces do offer something that people like, right? And that brings us to the other end of the spectrum. And that is most free open source software, such as R or Python, uh, for many uh, people, it's less intuitive and it requires knowledge of computer programming. So you could say at this point, like, okay, but you know, we should just, uh, uh, we should just persist and learn how to program, and then we can use these, lang these, these programming languages for our statistical analyses. And you could do that, but I would still argue that there's a role for graphical user interfaces. So I personally, I program in R, but if I know that an analysis has been implemented in JASP, I never use R, I always use JASP. Right? And the reason is I am, I'm a hundred times faster with JASP because I don't need to search for the function. I don't need to remind myself what the arguments are. I don't need to think about how I can best construct a figure, uh, how I scale things. And, you know, it's just everything has been automatized. So if you do things repeatedly, it's nice to have them automatized. And if you're very good and very structured in R, maybe you're only 10 times slower and not 100 times slower. But I'm 100 times slower. Okay, so JASP was kind of a solution to the Scylla Charybdis problem in uh, statistics. So we do have an intuitive graphical user interface, but it's also completely free and open source software. So when we started, we basically said, let's do SPSS had it been done right. So those of you who have worked with SPSS will recognize some features, right? We drag and drop variables uh, uh, into boxes. Um, and there's uh, some other uh, sort of look and feel issues that, that will be familiar, but uh, we, we did basically implement only the features we liked and we, we didn't implement the stuff we didn't like, which was a, a lot. So uh, you'll see that when I, uh, when I uh, demonstrate the program in action. So uh, I already mentioned JASP, JASP offers classical and Bayesian tools. And, uh, but it also allows users to contribute add-on functionality through modules, right? So this is how we keep the interface simple. I think that's one of the problems with SPSS. Uh, you're kind of, as a user, as a student, 20 years ago, I was already overwhelmed with all the different options they would, they would offer. And so we're, we have tried to keep things simple and only make available initially the analyses that are really important and then if you want something extra, you activate a module. And um, this is of course, similar to R where they have a base R and then you have packages that you can upload if you want extra functionality. But if you don't want that functionality, you're not, it's not in the way. And I will uh, uh, show you later that we're also responsive to feature requests and bug reports. And this is the most important way in which you can help JASP. If you see a problem, tell us about it, right? So we can fix it. So our motivation was twofold. 
pre-academia from the SPSS stranglehold and popularized Bayesian statistics. Oh, look at that. That was not me. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the main, the, the first goal was really to popularize Bayesian statistics. Um, and initially, I didn't want to include any classical statistics or p-values. I had to be convinced by the Trojan horse argument, right? Maybe people will use it for their classical analyses. But then as they're doing their classical analyses, they will see this button that shows you a Bayesian alternative. And maybe they click that button and then we draw them in like that. And then I said, okay, let's just add the classical analyses. And of course, what happened is that now everybody is using it for the classical analyses and not for the Bayesian analyses. And in fact, at one point, somebody emailed me and said, thank you very much for developing JASP. I use it a lot. It's a great program. But you know, the the uh, install file is of several hundred megabytes. And uh, I wonder, couldn't you just take out the Bayesian analyses and then it will be much, uh, 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 you know, wouldn't be so big, which was of course, exactly the opposite of what we wanted to accomplish. Anyway, so um, this is our world map. So on Twitter and on our website, we ask people, who use JASP in their curriculum, right? So at a university in their curriculum, when they use JASP to let us know. And, and when they let us know, they get a pin on our world map. So, so far uh, we know that JASP is being used in over 60 countries in over 240 universities. Um, I hope it's an underestimate um, because, you know, uh, uh, not everybody will see our Twitter uh, request or respond to whatever we say on our website. And of course, for this lecture, I uh, had to zoom in on a specific part of the world here. And you actually see that in Indonesia, uh, JASP is relatively popular. And we always knew this, of course. Um, so that's uh, especially uh, pleasing for me to talk to you today, because I know that uh, the JASP is being used uh, quite a lot in, uh, in Indonesia. So our website, jaspstats.org, is a hub where you can find many things related to JASP. We have a link to YouTube videos, blog posts, manuals, articles, GIFs, and, uh, and more. So um, I, I would encourage you to check it out. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Nobody? Everything is clear? Okay. So there, there are ways in which you can help Jazz. So of course you can follow us on Twitter. And if you, if you follow us on Twitter, uh, we don't post a lot, but we often retweet things that people say who have used JASP, for instance. And we also announce new versions and we announce blog posts and workshops. <clears throat> and uh, speaking of blog posts, uh, you can keep track of them. They sometimes have tutorials or news announcements uh, so this one that I have over here uh, mentions the result of a project where we verified the JASP output with other statistical packages. I think we, we used Minitab, SPSS, or a few others as well. Um, and, and this was also in response to um, a request from the company we were working with, right? Because if a company switches to a new statistics program, especially when it's an open source program, they really, really really want to be convinced that it gives the correct results, right? So this was kind of also to uh, show everybody like, look, uh, it works. And I should say, so the um, underlying, the engine of JASP, the, 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 where the actual analyses happen is R, 
right? So we use R packages uh, and, and base R for our results. And then the graphical user interface is, is programmed in a C++ style language, which is called Qt, Qt. So I've mentioned it already, but if you have bug reports or feature requests, please post them on our GitHub page. And uh, we have a blog post that you see referenced over, uh, over, over there um, that shows you how you create a GitHub account, because that's the only thing you need to do, create a GitHub account. But then you're in direct contact with the whole programming team. And it's uh, really convenient uh, to discuss things with the team that way. So this is a screenshot of that blog post, how to request a feature or report a bug in Jazz. And then when you actually go to our GitHub page, you are then uh, confronted with a choice to either issue a bug report or a feature request. And then if you choose one or the other, you get to our issues list, and then you, you'll see other people who have uh, mentioned uh, certain feature requests or bug reports, and uh, some of those issues will be closed because they've been dealt with. Others are still open. And uh, then sometimes there, there's a discussion back and forth between the, the, the user or the person who made the uh, request or bug report and the team. So it may also happen that you have questions that are more about statistics and not so much about the program itself. Um, so uh, that would be a question more for the uh, methodologists and not for the uh, C++ programmers, basically. Right? And if you have questions like that, like I've conducted this particular analysis, I get this particular, these particular results, but it doesn't, I, I don't know how to interpret it correctly, or this is my interpretation, is that correct? Or, you know, these kinds of things, statistical questions, then, then I would direct you to the JASP forum. And uh, it's called the JASP and Base Factor Forum. So Base Factor is the R package that we make a lot of use of in, uh, in the JASP program. And, uh, and this is a screenshot of that. So you see a few issues that need to be responded to and others that have been, uh, that have been dealt with. So I, it's mostly me uh, answering. So uh, sometimes uh, I'm a bit overwhelmed and it takes longer for me to respond. But uh, generally, uh, I, 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 I try to look every few days and, and answer. <clears throat> so the current version of JASP, the one that I will be talking about shortly, is 16.3. And we have 16.4 in the making as we speak. And it has a lot of uh, additional cool features. Um, there's also experimental uh, features you can try. These are unsigned versions, right? So when we have a signed version in terms of software, you can download it and it installs and it doesn't complain because we've signed it. So the operating systems know that it's been, you know, that it's approved, that it's from a safe source. But uh, if you're daring, you can also download and uh, an experimental version on that page over there. If you just Google JASP nightly, then you'll probably get there. Um, and uh, those are unsigned. So your computer will complain and say like, we don't know where this comes from. Should you install it? And you should just say yes, because it's a safe source. You know this, the computer doesn't. But you should just persist and then you can install it. And then you can basically get a glimpse of what we will be doing in the future. Right? There's no guarantees that any of it works, right? That's why it's an ex experimental version, um, but, uh, but that's the very latest that we, uh, that we have. And so for instance, if you check out this uh, version, which is going to be 16.4, you will see, for instance, that we added uh, database uh, support. So in that version, you will be able to go open and then uh, instead of just going to a file on your computer, you, you're actually able to open a database like SQL and, uh, and uh, then get data from that database and analyze it, which is pretty cool. Okay, 
So that was my introduction. And uh, I'm ready now to uh, give you a, a run through of JASP uh, using uh, my favorite data set, the Adam Sandler data set. Um, it's a data set I collected myself. And uh, I, I, I usually uh, demonstrate JASP with that data set. But so far, are there, are there, uh, uh, are there questions before we turn to the JASP mm -hmm. demo? What version of R are you using the ZEPS 16.3? Oh, we, uh, I forget, it's probably not the very latest version, but uh, it's, a, it's a relatively recent version. We do try to keep up to date mm -hmm. uh, because if you do not keep up to date, you're accumulating sort of, um, uh, uh, you're, you're running into a larger and larger debt if you don't do that. So, uh, and this is actually one of the problems of problems of uh, programs such as JASP that nobody sees. The programmers have to do a lot of work in the background to keep it up to date, right? Because operating systems change, uh, security levels in the Mac go up, uh, R functions change, and then stuff start, stops working, right? So we have to keep up. And just keeping up and maintaining the software is already uh, if you're talking about a large project like this, this it's already a, a quite a quite an endeavor. But yeah, it's a, I'm not sure of the exact version number we have, but it's it's really recent. I think we we updated everything uh, two months ago to the most recent uh, uh, version. Yeah, yeah, we try to have a fast release cycle, but we also have to check very carefully before we release that everything is working, and so that always uh, takes some time. So one question that inevitably arises whenever I talk about JASP uh, is, uh, can you get the R code that gives you the analysis? Right? And so it's open source. So you could get it from our GitHub uh, site and you could figure out exactly what we do, but it's tedious, right? What you really want is a button that just goes copy R code, and then you could potentially even just copy paste it into your uh, into your own uh, console and get the same result. Right? So that's, we do not have that currently, but it's, it, we will have it shortly. So it's version 0 0.17 will, will have that. And uh, this is what the programmers are working on currently. And I've seen what we have at the moment and it's already, I think it's, uh, it's uh, spectacular. So it's really cool. So one thing that they do, for instance, uh, I will just describe it because it's it's not there yet in the version that I have. But one thing that they that you can do, for instance, if you run an ANOVA, is that you can tick a box that says R code, and then you can see the syntax as you drag and drop variables, tick options, right? Then the R syntax changes, and so it's a two-way street. So you could you could manipulate the GUI and see the corresponding R code, but you could also change the R code and then it changes the GUI options. So it's, uh, it's really quite cool, um, but it's not there yet. It's, but it's uh, definitely uh, our uh, uh, main thing we're working on right now. So I'll be very relieved once we have it because I've been wanting this for about eight years. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just always, uh, there were always other priorities. Um, but now uh, uh, we're on the cusp of, uh, of getting this. Can you combine with R signing so you can publish in the web? Uh, yeah, I, that, that is. Um, so the, uh, so I, I, I would like to, there's several uh, pro projects going into the future that, um, that we are exploring. We also want to have a web version uh, for the browser. Um, and, uh, and it would be interesting to even integrate it better with, uh, even better with R. And uh, I'm not sure how it would work exactly with Shiny, but um, if, you have, if you have a particular suggestions, right? This would also be, be great for, a, for a, it's not really a feature request, I guess. It's more of a like, 
hey, this is a direction that you guys could go in. We and we also welcome that, of course, absolutely. But you know, with these, with a project such as this, there's always a, a, a large wish list of uh, of things, and uh, and we have to set priorities because we it's a large team, but it's still small compared to the wish list. So uh, we're basically going to do uh, uh, our syntax. And then we're going to put data editing in properly. You can do a few things right now. And we've implemented data editing for the company we're working with. But it's not yet in the official JASP release. Uh, and we want to do it well. And so if we have both data editing in there and uh, our syntax, then, then it's JASP 1.0. Uh, and before that, all the versions will be 0. Point something. OK, so uh, without further ado, um, let me switch to JASP. So I already I just installed it on this computer. And uh, uh, so here it is. You see 16.3. Let me just hide some controls here. Um, so um, <clears throat> you see that there are um, a number of options here on the ribbon, and uh, they have been grayed out, meaning that you can't open uh, open them. Because for most analyses, JASP actually wants you to open a data file first. Not all. There are analyses we offer uh, that work without uh, a, a data file. So in order to, to see those, for instance, you can go to this plus sign over here. And this opens the list of modules we have. So for instance, the one of the modules that we uh, can explore later on is the learn base module. So if I tick that, you see that it now becomes active over here. And, uh, and it is not grayed out. So that means we can actually use it without a data file open. But that's an exception. Most of this is uh, uh, requires a data file. So let's just open the data file. Um, <clears throat> you see there are preferences here, and I'll go over them uh, later. But we're going to open a data file. So there's different options. We can open a recent file. Um, it's interesting, I haven't, oh, I have a previous version of JASP on this computer, and there I probably opened, opened this uh, data file, and it, it remembered that. That's pretty nice. So um, recent uh, files I could use, I could browse my computer, or I could log in to the Open Science Framework, and then go to a particular, go to my directory there, and I can upload and download data files from the Open Science Framework. Or I could go to the JASP data library. The JASP data library presents over 50 data sets uh, that can be used to illustrate uh, different analyses. So in this case, you see that it had, has several uh, folders, but I'm going to pick regression. And here you see the, the first one is the Adam Sandler data set. So there are two icons you can click on, right? This one where I'm standing now says open data file. And that just opens the vanilla data file with no analyses at all. If I would click here, it says open JASP file, then I get the same data, but with an annotated JASP analysis. Um, so uh, this is useful if you're if you're unsure about a particular statistical analysis. Then you can just go over a few examples that have been analyzed with JASP and whose output has been interpreted. But here, I will just um, go for the vanilla data set, and then we'll analyze it as we uh, go along. Now. It's a bit of a strange data set, which is one of the reasons I like it so much. So let me demonstrate it to you. So I'm going to click here. 
And now you see the data in spreadsheet format. So um, what I did is I looked at all the movies that involved Adam Sandler starting in the year 2000 and then ending in the year 2015. I, so I collected these data in 2015. And then um, you see that the second column is the, or actually let me go to the final column. The, the final column is the movie title. So those are text strings and that's indicated by this, um, by this icon here that indicates the type of the variable. It has this letter A in it, which means it's, uh, it's uh, text. So it just guesses automatically what the measurement level is of these variables. And so you can see, for instance, that the last row in this data set is for Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. And, and then the third column is box office success. So at the box office, this movie uh, gained almost $70 million. Uh, dollars. And then the final one, the second column, is freshness. So this is the freshness rating on the movie website Rotten Tomatoes, where basically users can indicate whether they liked the movie or disliked the movie. And the movie that many people disliked is close to zero, it's rotten. And a movie that many people like is closer to one and it's uh, fresh. So this is a freshness rating and 6% is, is not very good. But then again, 70 million is uh, very good. So why this data set? Um, there was a hypothesis, and I won't go into detail, but there was a hypothesis that there, uh, that uh, for movies that star Adam Sandler, there is no correlation between the quality of the movie and how well it does at the box office. Right? And so these data allow us to test that hypothesis, right? because you would generally assume, at least that was my assumption, that more people go to see good movies. Uh, but maybe that's not the case for Adam Sandler. Maybe some people just like him and go to any movie that he's in and they don't care about quality at all. So we'll, uh, we'll see. Uh, you do see now that now we have the data set open, all of these icons are now no longer grayed out. So now we can actually use them. So, uh, so uh, let's explore some options. So I'm going to continue for another, um, let's say for another eight minutes. Uh, and then at the hour, uh, I think we should just have a small break uh, and then we can, uh, we can continue. Okay, so the first thing I usually do when I get data is I go to descriptives to, to understand what I'm looking at and to see whether the models that I am thinking of applying make any sense at all. So descriptives. So uh, we can take a variable such as freshness and we can move it over to the variable box. And when that happens, you will see over here in the output panel, the output panel will immediately be populated. So here you go. Right, so now we have a table here that gives some results for, uh, for freshness. Um, so you see there are 30, 31 movies. The mean freshness rating is 27%. And there's a certain minimum and a certain maximum. Now, we might, we might want different features here. So down below are several options. Statistics, basic plots, customizable plots, and tables. So we go to statistics, we open that tab, and we see that there are certain options that are already ticked such as the mean, the minimum, and the maximum. Well, maybe we don't care about the minimum and the, and the maximum, so I'm gonna untick them. And this has now removed them from the table. Maybe I want the median, and maybe I don't want the mean, right? So this way you can create the table you like, uh, and you also get immediate, uh, immediate feedback. 
we can uh, also add another uh, variable. So maybe we want to look at freshness, but also maybe at box office success. Right. And there you see um, the second column is for box office success. So the median value of box office success is actually, and this is a purely coincidence, uh, is actually, I think, the exactly the value we looked at for Paul Blart Molkop 2, right? So that, that value that was almost 70 million. Um, and the standard deviation is pretty high, meaning that some movies do much better, some movies do worse. Um, now you also see here that, uh, and, and I guess this is one of the advantages when you uh, have a statistics program that you use in universities and the people who develop it also work at universities because then you know what, what is needed, right? And so for instance, what is not needed in your table are vertical lines. Right? Uh, and so this table is more in APA style. So that means that if you want, you could copy that table and then insert it into your Word document which means you don't have to uh, type the different numbers, right? If you, if you have to type them from your, uh, from your file or even copy paste the individual's ones uh, to your Word document, it uh, can be a source of mistakes. Uh, for those of you, uh, the geeks who use LaTeX, uh, I use LaTeX, I'm a geek. Uh, we, we actually have LaTeX code for the tables as well. And uh, everybody who's worked with LaTeX knows how that it's, Creating tables is not the most fun thing. So sometimes when I have to create a table in LaTeX, I just go to JASP, do some analysis, and then copy the LaTeX uh, code and adjust it to create my table. But the, the coolest thing, I think, of all of, uh, of all of this is that for anything that JASP has as output, you can add notes. So you can do that here. So add note, and now, we can add a description here. Um, so obviously, this is not a, uh, and we can also, if we wanted to, we can format that in many different ways, as you see on top here. So um, now this is not very informative, of course. This is a nice table, but you can understand that you can make it informative. Uh, you can, for instance, describe what is the data set. Uh, and I would actually do that over here. Uh, right. So immediately on the results, uh, uh, you could say this data set. So you can you can have you can have the description of the data set here. You can have the goal of the analysis. And then under each analysis, you can, for instance, summarize the main conclusion, but you could also ask questions, right? And if you then send the JASP file to your colleagues or to your students, then they could look at the analyses, analysis that you've done and they could perhaps answer those questions or do new analyses. And uh, this is a nice way to, uh, uh, to do data analysis, I think. Um, right, so I do think actually in, in terms of teaching and collaboration, I think JASP offers uh, a number of, uh, of possibilities. Um, now, suppose you've done your analysis and now you, you wanna save it. So if you just save the analysis, it uh, saves it or, or save the, if you save the file, it saves it as a dot JASP file. And the .js file retains everything that you have done. So obviously the data, but also the analyses, the output, and the annotations. So you get everything back just as if you had just worked on it. So that means also that if you have a series of analyses, if you go back to an old analysis and you click on it, you get the corresponding input panel. So you know exactly what you did to uh, to get your um, to get your output, so there's you can always go back and know exactly what analysis uh, you did to to get your output. 
which I think is really important because people forget things. Now, it can also happen that maybe you want to share your, your, uh, your output, your results, but not your data, right? Maybe the data come from a company and they didn't want to, you to share the data or, uh, you know, there could be other reasons. So if we now go back to our hamburger menu, uh, you see that there's several options that have now been activated. And one of them is export results. So if you do export results, it only takes the results and it saves them. And it's actually an HTML file. So, um, so uh, yeah, that um, you can do that too. Um, so then let me just describe uh, these four buttons over here. And then I think it's time for a break. So the first one is very simple. You can edit the title. So uh, that's that. Um, then the second one, that's really uh, nice. It allows you to duplicate an analysis, right? So it could be, for instance, that you want to compare the result of one analysis to the result of another analysis, right? But you want to retain the old analysis. And the easiest way is then to say, okay, I'm going to duplicate this. So now I get a copy, right? The original one is still there, right here on top. So this is the old one, and this is the new one. And you can do a new analysis here. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, well, whatever you want to do, and then you can compare the result, uh, results by uh, uh, looking over here. And then finally, oh, and, and then, uh, sorry, we have two buttons to go. The blue one, it gives you information. It's a help file. So here, you get information about the different options and what, uh, what they offer. And then all the way at the end, we have a list of the R packages that we used and some references. And then finally, this button, you have to be very careful with, it removes the analysis. So gone. So I want to show you a bit more. Uh, about uh, descriptives. In particular, I want to show you something about the, the graphs uh, that we have, but it's uh, slightly over the hour and I've been talking for at least 45 minutes. So I think we could all use a break. So uh, how, long, uh, how long should we, uh, should we uh, have, the, have the break? I don't wanna be too... Um, Ambitious, um, maybe 10 minutes. Yeah, I 10 think minutes 10, 10 minutes sounds reasonable. Yeah, so we, we can clean a talk pass three. Yeah. Great. See you in 10 minutes. See you in 10 minutes. And uh, uh, for, for, for the attend, uh, untuk rekan-rekan uh, peserta, jika ada pertanyaan, komentar, dan seterusnya, soal Madrid, uh, bisa ditulis di kolom Okay, I'll, I'll see everyone in, uh, in 10 minutes. Uh, go grab a coffee, uh, take a walk a bit. Uh.
Untuk rekan-rekan peserta, selamat bergabung kembali sambil kita menunggu EJ. Seperti yang tadi saya sampaikan di awal, jika ada pertanyaan, komentar, boleh langsung ditanyakan atau juga dituliskan di chat. Bisa juga private chat saya dalam bahasa Inggris atau bahasa Indonesia, nanti bisa saya sampaikan juga. Okay, I think uh, it's time to get going again. Yep. Yes. I'm here. I'm just moving to a different place because it's too cold. Good. And yeah, I think the 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 attendees are are here as well. Great. Okay, so um, let's continue. I said I wanted to show you some plots, so I'll. I'll do that right now. And obviously, I mean, this is just scratching the surface of what we can do here, right? Time is too short to show you everything. But, but we did try to make it such that um, you can explore this by yourself. And, um, and hopefully, uh, it, it, it wouldn't be too difficult to figure out uh, the additional options and what they do. OK. So uh, let's uh, do a plot. I'll, I'll do customizable plot. And I'll go for a scatter plot. And I've already selected freshness and box of a success. So uh, the default settings give us this plot where we, we see the relationship. And there doesn't seem to be a very clear relationship here. We get the marginal distributions of freshness and of box of success uh, at the edges of this graph. Um, of course, in, in the social sciences, you generally don't see a plot like this. Usually, we do not have the graphs either above the scatter plot or to the right of it. And we generally do not use this smooth regression line. But if we have a regression line, it's linear. And the confidence interval, you can show it, but quite often uh, something like this is what we see. And here, um, it's relatively surprising, was surprising to me at least, that uh, there does not seem to be a strong relation at all between freshness and box office success. So movie quality does not appear to be associated with uh, success at the box office for movies starring Adam Sandler. OK. Um, so, um, so now let's, uh, let's actually do a statistical analysis. So we could do several, but here we're really looking to do a correlation. So not a t-test. If I tick on t-test, you see that we have independent samples, paired samples, one sample t-test. That's the classical uh, t-test, the frequentist t-test. But then we have a Bayesian echo. So this is where, um, where the Trojan horse comes in. Right? You might be looking to do this one, and then you think, hmm, what would happen if I would do this one? Same for ANOVA. 
we have the classical analyses and the Bayesian analyses. So sometimes you see that the echo isn't complete. We don't have a Bayesian manova here, but um, that also gives an idea of what we will be doing in the future. But sometimes, you know, these analyses, these Bayesian echoes do not yet exist and we have to actually build them ourselves first. We have mixed models. We have uh, frequencies, so a multinomial test, uh, contingency tables, uh, log linear regression. We have factor analysis, um, but what we want is regression. So uh, we could look at uh, correlations, linear regression, logistic regression, or do the generalized linear model. Here, we're just going to select the classical correlation. So we are interested in freshness and box office success. We drag it in. If we wanted to, we do, could do a partial correlation and add a, a covariate. And what this gives us is a table. So if we uh, put in more variables, well, let me put in year. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But uh, uh, if we do it, you see that the matrix is now increased and we see the, uh, the correlations, the Pearson correlations between the variables. And we care about this one between box office success and freshness. And the sample correlation coefficient is just slightly lower than zero, consistent with our visual impression from above here. <clears throat> so I should just remind you that if we wanted to see the, the options that gave rise to this figure in descriptives, all we need to do is click on it and it brings back the, uh, the, the GUI that, uh, that, that produced this uh, result. So we were here. So, um, so of course, we can also show a confidence intervals on those uh, on the coefficient, and of course, it's not statistically uh, significant. Uh, we could do Spearman's row, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we also have plots here. Um, for instance, let me do the scatter plot. So this is actually an entire matrix because we can, if I just tick, let me just tick a few things here. And then hopefully this will work. Oh. oh, there we go. This took a little bit of time. Right. So now you see that that entire matrix is filled with uh, information, with confidence intervals and, um, and the marginal distribution of the variables <clears throat> but also with the sample coefficients and their 95% uh, confidence intervals, right? And they belong, so this one belongs to the uh, mirrored panel uh, over to the other side. Um, right. Um, yeah, so, so there's various other options you could uh, explore. But uh, we see here that it's not statistically significant, but obviously that doesn't tell us whether we have support for the absence of the effect or whether we were just underpowered and the data aren't diagnostic. So if we wanna, if we wanna assess whether we have, actually have evidence in favor of the null hypothesis, we can do a Bayesian analysis. So we go to Bayesian correlation, we drag in freshness and box office success. And for this, so we immediately get our, uh, our table and now it gives us a base factor. I don't have time to go into it, but the base factor basically uh, quantifies the predictive success of the null versus the alternative. Um, and in this case, I'll switch it so that it's in favor of the null. In this case, the null out predicts the alternative hypothesis by a factor of 4.4. If we wanna see nice pictures, we can go to plot individual pairs that allows us to zoom in on a pair of interest. And in this case, we are only interested in this particular pair, freshness and box office success. So we drag it over. The scatter plot is produced by default, but 
we can also with one click, and so this is what I meant when I said Jasp is so much faster than I play with myself. I can get this plot with one click. This shows us the uh, prior distribution on the correlation coefficient as a dotted line and the posterior as a solid line with all extra information here. We can change the prior distribution, by the way, if we wanted to through uh, changing this number here. So for instance, if we change this to 0.5, we get a different analysis, a different prior. And if we wanted to do a sequential analysis, again, one tick. And over here, we see how the evidence changes as Adam Sandler makes more movies. So if we were to go to the movie website now, and we would see what movies Adam Sandler made after 2015, we could add them to the data set. And if we rerun the analysis, it will just produce extra dots that show how the evidence changes as the data accumulate. So EJ, we have a question in the chat room. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's from uh, my statistics teacher, actually, so years and years back, Professor Bernadette Setiadi from Atmajaya Catholic University. Uh, she said that you said that one of your original purposes was to develop gas to popularize Bayesian statistics. She knows very little about Bayesian. Can you explain why? What is the advantages of Bayesian statistics? I know that you can go very lengthy here, but... Uh, I'll be short. I'll be short. Okay. And in fact, what I want to do is uh, demonstrate the learn Bayes module in yeah. a moment. And, uh, and I, I guess uh, we'll see some of those advantages in action. But I think... Um, Excellent. Um, I think these two plots here actually demonstrate a few of those advantages. So for instance, uh, what we have here is some evidence with this prior distribution, the, the, uh, uh, the, the null out predicts the alternative, this particular alternative given by this dotted uh, distribution by a factor of three, right? So we have evidence in favor of the null. This is, this is nice that we can discriminate absence of evidence from evidence of absence. And then we can also do a sequential analysis really easily. We just monitor how our information, how our uncertainty changes over time. And uh, both of those things, you can kind of try to do this in, within a classical framework and you'll get to, but, but you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult and it's not immediately obvious that it will be the right thing to do. So uh, the Bayesian framework in, in that sense is more intuitive. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, there was one other thing that I wanted to demonstrate. This doesn't work with all plots, but I think it's, it will work with this one because, uh, you know, sometimes R makes default choices, right? With, or R always makes default choices with respect to the scaling of the axes. And sometimes the scale is not to your liking, or sometimes you want to compare two panels and R makes one dec scaling decision for the one panel and one for the other one. So uh, we have a, a graph editor. So let's see whether it works. So if we do scatter plot, we can go, uh, we can just copy it. Then we save it as it's available uh, as a PNG. Uh, we can also copy citations for the, for the, for the citations that gave rise to the, that correspond to that analysis. We can save the image. And if we do save image, we can save it as, you know, what do we have? PDF, EPS, TIFF, PPTX, and SVG. Uh, but we can also edit the image. And when we then we get a rudimentary uh, image editor. So what I'm going to try to do is, uh, is get this axis to go from 0 to 1 instead of from 0 to 0.8. So let's see. Uh, Okay, and now I do want those uh, ticks there. Right, and here we go, right? So now we have added this part of the axis and you can also see why 
are actually made a pretty good decision, I think, here. Um, uh, but anyway, so so uh, yeah, this is just a start, right? Uh, we want the editor to do uh, to do more things, but at least uh, you can uh, you can change the tick marks, you can change the what's on the the labels on the axes and the length of the uh, uh, the axes. Um, okay, so oh yeah, there are other things I I. Uh, Let's let's just see because there's other things I can uh, demonstrate. So uh, right, we have the output panel here, we have the input panel over here, but of course we also still have our data panel. Right, and there's uh, two things you can do with the data now uh, that are really important. So this is uh, filtering and computing new columns. So maybe you say, well. Yeah, I don't want to do. Uh, I don't want to look at box office success. I want to look at the log of box office success. Oh, and I, I should say so. You can't edit individual numbers directly in Jasp, but if I double click, the uh, it opens uh, your data editor, which is usually some Excel type editor, and then you can edit it in Excel. Press save, and then automatically the analyses in Jasp are all updated. I think this is a really brilliant solution, but uh, as it turns out, people still would very much like a data editor in JASP itself. So we're working on that currently. But anyway, so let me, so suppose you want log of box office success. We press the plus sign, add computed column. And now I can create that computed column either in R through R code or through our drag and drop formulas. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate. Hopefully, oh, I need to give it a name. So uh, log box office success, say, and then create column. So what we can do here is, uh, I think we have log defined, log, and then we go freshness, and we add that here and we do compute column and we're done, right? And this gives us our, uh, our log. Uh, but as you can see, we have an immediate problem here because Bucky Larson, born to be a star, actually had zero freshness. And we, when we take the log, it's minus infinity. So obviously we should have tried uh, a different transformation, maybe add a small offset or something. Uh, but maybe there's something wrong with this with this movie. So let's say we just want to exclude it, right? So, um, so that's what we do with our filter. So this is the drag and drop filter. Um, and so we're going to say uh, if freshness is larger than zero, then we're, it's going to be passed through. So now if we look at this, see you, oh, uh, where was it? Oh, here, now you see it's been filtered out. And you see information uh, on the filter over here. And now we can use this this uh, uh, this column uh, for our uh, additional analyses. Okay, so this is this is my this is my run through, uh, and then uh, in in the time we have left, I think uh, I want to show you our, our learn base module that I'm really enthusiastic about myself. Uh, so we will we'll collect some data here, and um, and then, uh, and then I'll show you how Bayesian updating works and, and uh, how you can use this tool. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll just go over the, some of the modules because I'm really proud of, of some of the modules we have made and they usually don't get the attention they deserve. So I do want to show them to you. And then we're gonna turn to the Learn Bayes module because showing that, those modules, I won't go into detail. I'm just going to show you it's there and it's great. And, and then we'll move on. So I think that will only take a few minutes. 
and then we're going to do learn base. So are there any uh, questions so far? Not yet, so, but, uh, but I have the feeling that uh, a lot of people want to learn more about uh, base and its advantages. So I'll, I'll let, let you run through the modules and go to the learn, learn base part. Okay. Well, you know, I cannot, I cannot give an introduction to patient statistics in the time we have left, not a proper one at least. No, not that, uh, no, no, no. But, uh, but I'll, I'll show you some of the tools we've developed and that I'm using right now in my courses on Bayesian statistics. And so to me, it's a great help actually to have. So I've, I was also a little egotistical when I uh, worked with other people to create the learn base module because I use it in my own teaching. But there's other modules as well. So let me just highlight a few of the ones that I think are particularly uh, nice. So when we go to uh, uh, modules, um, I, I love all of them actually. But um, let me just highlight a few. So I'm going to select audit, machine learning, meta analysis, quality control. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Okay. So, uh, for instance, when you do audit, and so this is, has been programmed mainly by Kun Dex, and he's at Nijmegen Business University. And so um, he, um, he's working very much with financial audits, right? So the auditor samples a set of financial records and wants to confirm that, the over, that, that it's good enough, right? So uh, there's a statistic, there's a planning, a selection and evaluation and a, an analysis stage. And that is basically echoed here in this, uh, in this workflow. So, uh, then we have machine learning. And uh, what we have here is methods for regression, classification, clustering. And I think there's below, there's prediction. And you see all the standard machine learning techniques, uh, nearest neighbors, a neural network, random forest, a sport vector machine, a linear discriminant, or fuzzy C means, uh, et cetera. Right? So, um, with JASP, it's relatively straightforward to um, carry out those analyses and also teach those analyses because you don't need to first, you know, familiarize yourself with a particular style of programming or a particular uh, programming language. You can just get going immediately. Um, we have uh, meta-analysis. So we have classical meta-analyses, including selection models, right, to account for publication bias. And uh, we also have Bayesian uh, selection uh, models. And uh, the, the, what, this, uh, what these methods uh, do generally, especially the robust Bayesian meta-analysis, uh, they consider a host of different models. Right? So you can have fixed effects models, random effects models, models with a treatment effect, models without a treatment effect, and models that combine those combinations with particular ways of publication bias. And then you can draw conclusions by looking at all those models simultaneously, instead of first selecting one and then doing inference on the parameters of the model you've selected, which induces all sorts of biases. We got a question about machine yeah. learning here. Yeah. So does the machine learning use the GPU as a regular machine learning software? Um, I think it, uh, he or she referred to the graphical processor, processing unit. Oh, oh uh, I am not sure, actually. So the, the thing is, it's grown so big that uh, I'm no longer uh, an expert on, on you know, particular analyses. And I've been involved years ago uh, with this uh, with this analysis, so I so we would be able to tell if we would go in there and look more carefully. But I don't dare uh, uh, I don't dare say this. It would obviously be a good idea because these analyses usually take a lot of time. The only thing I can say about it is that for many of the analyses that take a lot of time, we actually have a progress bar, so you know when it's time to grab a cup of coffee or uh, even uh, sleep 
uh, uh, go to go to bed. But uh, I can't answer that question. It's a good question, though. I do know that. Oh, I still have to talk about a little bit about that. That would be a mistake if I didn't. Uh, uh, our preference menu has some really cool options. Um, uh, but first, quality control. So quality control, this is what we did for the company. This has your typical uh, analyses that you use in kind of Six Sigma uh, uh, settings. So uh, we have, uh, for instance, gauge R&R, attributes agreement analysis, all sorts of control charts, capability study and design of analyses and probability of, uh, of detection. So uh, this is all uh, standard stuff that, uh, that a company would want. So let me just get rid of some of these because they clutter the ribbon. And let me briefly navigate to uh, preferences. So there's many things you could do, right? So uh, data controls certain uh, settings with respect to missing values. Uh, results, you can display exact p-values, uh, use a normalized notation, fix the number of decimals. Uh, we interface, we have a dark theme. Uh, there's also some other options. Safe graphics mode is sometimes a good idea when you experience problems with what it looks like. There's also advanced options for uh, uh, for developers. And I think we don't have it here right now, but in the upcoming version, you can also uh, uh, set the number of engines that uh, are being used. Um, and I think, I'm not sure whether that's in the next version, but then you're also able to kill particular engines when they're idle. Um, but obviously, uh, it's also interesting to uh, see that JASP is available in different languages. So uh, we, we have several languages. We're pretty complete with those. So French, uh, sorry, Spanish, Galician, Dutch, Portuguese, um, uh, Chinese, Japanese. But let's just do this one. I ne I've never done this before. but. Uh, there is, in fact, an Indonesian translation. So you see that um, that it is uh, partial, but I do see some words I don't uh, understand here, for instance. Um, but uh, not everything has been done. That's why it's incomplete. But we have set it up so that if you want to help with the translations, it's relatively straightforward to do. We use a particular... Um, a service a web late, and uh, that has allowed many people to uh, contribute. Uh, so I think we also have a translation in Italian coming up. But when we go, for instance, to uh, German, uh, now you see that uh, much more has uh, changed. In fact, everything has changed here. Right. So the the German translation is complete, and it and everything is uh, is is uh, basically uh, uh, translated the entire GUI. But let's quickly go back to English. And uh, in the remaining time, I would like to uh, uh, go over some of the functionality of the Learn Base module. So, Learn Base in statistics with simple examples and supporting text. So, what we offer are uh, a number of Bayesian um, tools. Um, and uh, so, the problem of points is a standard. Uh, problem. It, in fact, it started modern uh, statistics, right? So this is the problem. You're playing a game. Maybe you're tossing a coin. It can land heads or tails with 50% chance. And you play for, say, a stake, let's say uh, uh, $10. You play against a friend and you say the first one who reaches six points wins, right? And so you toss it. It's heads. One of, like, say, you get a point. If it's tails, your friend gets a point. And the person who reaches six, the first wins, right? And so uh, the score is four to two. And then the game is interrupted. How do you fairly divide the stake? Right? And there's a, there's a solution to that. That's the game of chance. But when it becomes Bayesian is when it's a game of skill. So now it's no longer a game of, it's, it's no longer a coin, a fair coin you toss. But now it could be games of backgammon. 
So now when you're leading 4-2, the fair division of the stake is no longer the same because you, the reason that you're leading 4-2 could be that you're the better player. Right? So you need to take that into account. And so, uh, well, I can just actually show you. Uh, so let me actually kill some of the other uh, things we've done. So here, for instance, um, you see uh, where they start at one point and they need to go to, to two. So that's, so that's a very simple situation where it should be 0.5, the probability that player A wins the game. And we do a little simulation here to show that that's indeed correct, right? So the red line is, the, is correct. And then the, uh, uh, the, the simulation is what undulates. And we can add information about the relative skill of the players. Um, uh, but anyway, that's not what I want to, uh, to uh, uh, demonstrate. Uh, I want to turn to binomial estimation. So uh, we are going to enter a sequence of uh, observations and we're going to estimate something. So what are we going to estimate? Uh, we're going to estimate the proportion of people from Indonesia who attend uh, workshops on uh, computer programs who are who are cat people rather than dog people, right? So I'm simply going to ask you at one point, uh, do you prefer to have a cat or a dog, right? And then I'm going to score cat with one and well, I'm, I'm just actually going to uh, say C is cat and D is dog. Right, and then we're going to look at the proportion of people who prefer cats. Okay, so what are we going to do? Right, this is a Bayesian analysis, right? So in a Bayesian analysis, you have to specify what you believe about this proportion before you see any data, right? So we specify our model here. Um, so uh, I'm just going to call it cats versus dogs. And uh, if I use this particular distribution, then I'm going can show you what it is. I'm, I open prior and posterior distributions. I tick prior distribution, and and this here is our prior distribution. So this is a distribution of our belief concerning the proportion of cat versus dog people in the population. And this distribution says we have no clue. All values are equally likely. Now, I don't actually think this is a good distribution. I would have used something different, but for illustration, this is the one that people often come up with. Right, so this is going to be a prior distribution. So now um, I will just uh, ask, ask you to indicate uh, uh, a cat or dog. So can I get somebody to, so usually in an auditorium, I would just point to a certain person uh, but now uh, people are free to just uh, uh, give their preference, maybe in the chat, or you can just unmute yourself and say something. Cat yeah, or so, dog? So to, so to prevent the chaos, I think we can do, if you prefer cats, you get a thumbs up. And if you prefer okay. a dog, and then you, you react with a love. Okay. And, uh, then uh, I'll count. Uh, yeah, but let's start with the first one. So can you give me, can you give me just a random... Uh, First, I'll, I'm a I'm a cat person, I suppose. Okay, cat. <laughs> yeah. So, I type cat. I do uh, control enter. I have to indicate that cat is a success because we're interested in the proportion of cat people, right? And now, instead of the just the prior distribution, we're going to look at the posterior distribution. But I also want to see the I also want to see the prior distribution in the plot. Right, so, so you see the dotted line is a prior distribution, the solid line is our posterior distribution. So this now indicates that if we had to pick a single value for the proportion, we would say all people uh, in our population are cat people, right? which is strange, of course, right? That's not, that's not what you actually believe. So that indicates that this uniform distribution was maybe not the right choice. But I'm going to glance over that. 
in the interest of time. And let's uh, come up with another data point. Can I have a, can I have another observation, please? Maybe Chen or Bagas, uh, Pinkan says dog. Okay, great. So now you see that this is our posterior distribution, which means that we have now learned that not everybody is a cat person and not everybody is a dog person because we've seen examples of, uh, of a, a dog and cat preferences. And so the most likely values are now sort of in between, right? And if we wanted to, we could uh, summarize this posterior distribution. For instance, uh, we could show a mean and maybe a credible interval, which says 95% of this posterior distribution lies between 0 0.09 and 0 0.91, right? which is very, very wide. And that means we're very uncertain. So we could reduce our uncertainty by collecting some more data. So instead of cat versus dog, I will actually, I will actually, I'm not sure whether this is going to work. Yes, it will work. I'm just going to do C and D here. And I'm going to get some more observations. So are there, uh, observations you can just mention really quickly in succession. Let's do about 10. Yeah, dog, cat, cat, dog, cat, dog, cat, dog. Okay. Cat, dog, cat. <laughs> okay, great. Dog. I think that's, that's uh, sufficient. Okay, control. okay, okay. And so if we, if we do that, we can see that um, what this has has now done this information is it had made it has made extreme values less likely, right? So this is what it was before you saw the data, and this is what it is after you see the data, right? So values higher than what is it about 0.7 have become less likely, and also values lower than 0.3 have become less likely than they were before, but values between 0.3 and 0.7 have become more likely. And the most likely point, well, actually I show the mean here, it will be the same as the mode, but I can select the mode. I'll just show you how that's done. So the mode um, 0.5, so that's the, that's the highest, Point, that's the single most likely uh, value. So, um, so uh, another advantage I think of the Bayesian uh, framework is that this credible interval really means what you think it means. I'm 95% sure that the true value is in this interval, in this specific interval. And that is not the correct interpretation of a classical uh, confidence interval. I won't go there because uh, that would just take us too far afield. Um, so another thing that I would like to demonstrate is a sequential analysis, right? Because I've just done this as if we had the prior distribution, the, which is the dotted line over here. And the data came in all at once, but maybe the data came in one at a time. And after every new data point, the posterior distribution that I had becomes the prior distribution for the analysis of the next data point, right? So you have a cycle of learning. And we can see that better if we do a sequential analysis. So uh, let's just do sequential analysis and I take stacked distributions. And here you see how, the, how our beliefs change, how our uncertainty changes as we see more observations. So we started out with on top with this uniform prior distribution and then data came in and they gradually um, make our distribution more informative, right? So at the end, we end up with um, the distribution all the way at the front, uh, 
that has that, that shows that values higher than 0.8 or lower than 0.2 are really uh, very unlikely and values in the middle are uh, most likely. So there's there's much more to demonstrate. There's many more uh, uh, many additional options, but um, but I think this should at least give you an idea of what is possible with JASP and how easy it is, and also actually how inviting it is to interact with the program. I uh, I really like sort of exploring different options. And you, the nice thing about the graphical user interface is you get immediate feedback, right? You tick an option and immediately you see what it does. Um, and so I think that's really uh, a nice part of, uh, of JASP. So um, yeah, I, we're still, uh, we're still really pushing hard in the development. So I hope that in the future, uh, 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 I'm pretty sure that in the future, it will be even more, uh, it will offer even more features and hopefully uh, we strive to retain the same level of user friendliness. So that's what I uh, had to say. We still have some uh, time, I think, but this concludes my presentation. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ijin. So uh, we have some uh, some questions and I think we still have some time for, for other questions as well. So I'm gonna just read those questions in order where they came in. So an, a follow-up question about the machine learning module. Can we train the machine learning module? This is for well, Aranda's Halawi. And uh, yes, if, yes. You, so we, if you want to ask directly, go, go ahead as well. Right. So, so we have the, the usual uh, steps, right? Where you have a, a data set and you train it. There's a training set. And then you uh, have a, 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 a data set that you use for validation, basically. I think we actually have the option to split it in three uh, because sometimes when there's a training, you train and then you have a validation set and then you do that multiple times. And as, as soon as you start to do that multiple times, uh, you cannot fairly assess predictive performance. So then you need a third uh, data set to, to assess that uh, with. So we, uh, we do offer those, uh, the, just the standard options. So in fact, there's a, there's a book, I think it's by Tip Shirani, and uh, colleagues on machine learning, kind of a classic work, and our implementation was inspired by that. So everything that's in that book, or most of what's in that book, you should be able to do uh, with JASP. And the next question is somewhat related to R. Is there a plan to include Tidyverse uh, for data manipulation tools in, uh, in JASP? This is um, from Ray Fabian. Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, um, so I have always been a little. So far, that's definitely wasn't you know our focus. And I realized that data wrangling is is uh, you know one of those practical things that everybody's confronted with. And so it would be really nice. I'm just not quite sure in the GUI how that could best be implemented. But I think that having the deeper integration with R is a first step in that direction. And so one of the things, for instance, that we would really like to do is make it easier for people to go from long to wide uh, format, right? This is always a, an issue when you do data analysis and it's in the wrong format and you have to recode it and it's, it's unpleasant, right? So um, uh, it's certainly a good idea. I, I'm just not sure how we can make that uh, how we, but it should be given that we do the analyses in the way in the way that I described that you can tick R code and you can change the GUI and um, or change the R code and then stuff change. You should be able to do a similar thing for our um, for our spread, data spreadsheet. Um, but it's not, uh, you know, in I think with respect to data wrangling, that is probably the one aspect where I would say, you know, I think that it's very challenging to do right, I think. And, and maybe we can get it done, but uh, and it would be worth trying to see how far we can get there. Yeah. Good question. Another question by Joseph Edwin. Is there a differentiate uh, 
uh, are there different assumption, underlying assumption procedures that JASP use to analyze data? For, instance, uh, for example, compared to AMOS or PLSM, they have uh, assumptions, uh, different assumptions in terms of normal distribution constraint. Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, JASP is really uh, just a GUI on top of um, a set of analyses, right? So it really depends uh, on the specific analysis you're using. So for instance, I can show you, we have structural equation modeling. Uh, uh, for instance, what we have now, what we have currently, our SEM module. So we have mediation analysis, latent growth. But if we go to structural equation modeling, it uh, wants you to enter Lavan code. So then for that specific analysis, it's it's Lavan. So if you want to know, like, how do I do this particular model? How do I, then it's, we would just refer you to the uh, Lavan uh, support and website, because that's what we expect to see here, Lavan code. And so uh, we really just uh, uh, facilitate uh, between the user and specific uh, uh, programs. Um, but when particular assumptions are being made, that the user should be aware of, then I would hope that it is available in the help file. And if it's not in the help file, then obviously it would be a good feature request to say, can you add this to the help file? So uh, it's also safe to assume that because Janus run uh, in R, so the assumptions that holds true in R also is not holds true in, in Yes, Jan. yes. So, uh, Joseph and for Joseph and Ray and Arandas, uh, uh, do you have follow up questions or are those answers satisfactory? Um, and also, I would like to remind everyone there is uh, an attendance list. If you, you would like to get a certificate at the end of this uh, seminar, then uh, uh, Chen just uh, put the link on, on chat so, so you can fill in also the evaluation. Uh, for other participants, if you have uh, questions, uh, you can also ask uh, each other directly. Maybe while we wait, uh, one of the things that got uh, while we're running this this community with uh, with Bagas and Chen, the, one of the questions that we we got is that uh, some people would like to implement Jazz uh, uh, as opposed to SPSS, for instance, because uh, most of us uh -huh. are psychologists. Yeah. Uh, but they need a problem convincing their superiors or, yeah. or the admin people or the IT people and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what are the arguments uh, to, to choose uh, oh. as opposed oh. to SPSS? And how yeah. do we help uh, uh, some of us here who would like to cho uh, choose JASP instead of SPSS, for instance? Right. Uh, yes. So um, in, in, I've, I've been having this conversation a lot also with, with universities in the Netherlands, right? Um, so I think there's, there's so many arguments. Now, first of all, there's the money argument, right? Every year you have to uh, pay money for a license, um, but also you're training your students to use a program that they most likely will not be able to afford later on, right? Which is, doesn't strike me as good, uh, good practice. And then second of all, students will have a better experience, a better learning experience with JASP and with SPSS. I'm pretty sure all the, the, the sort of surveys that I've seen that people have done uh, support this. And it's also, you know, we're also more, a more recent program, right? So then you can look at what the other kind of avoid the mistakes that the other program has made. So I think there, uh, we also try to keep it really easy and straightforward. So for instance, we call a t-test a t-test and an ANOVA an ANOVA. And uh, in SPSS, it can be, you know, you, you'll get overwhelmed and confused by all the options and all the output. And, and so I think it's just easier for the student. The student will have a better learning experience. So in the end, I think there's, there's only winners. And certainly in the Netherlands right now, there's a strong general push away from uh, software that is closed sourced and developed by international companies because it creates this dependence um, that is really unfortunate. So um, in, in addition, with the whole uh, corona epidemic, I think that has underscored the, the importance that people should be able to access their software at any time, at any place, on any device. And I think with JASP, that is uh, 
that is really uh, 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 really straightforward. Also because of uh, yeah because of the lack of licenses. So um, yeah, so in in that sense, uh, I. So obviously, I, I've heard people say like, "Well, but uh, we 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 want to stay with SPSS because m many people use SPSS, right?" And I can kind of see that argument, but nothing's ever going to change with that mindset, obviously. And I also think that if you teach, what do you want to teach your students ultimately, right? It it has to be some sort of understanding of uh, of statistics, and I'm. You know, I am even willing to bet that if you teach students so, uh, in uh, SPSS to do a particular analysis, and then two years later, you give them either SPSS or JASP that they had, have never seen before, that they'll be quicker and more accurate with JASP. So, um, you know, I can't, that's my strong expectation because we, we just build it to, to uh, uh, fit with the user uh, in mind. So uh, I, 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 yeah, I think there's a lot of other arguments as well, but these are the ones that I can think of right now off the top of my head. Yeah, thanks. Uh, excellent answer. I think that's, uh, that's also the, the arguments that uh, we had in mind. And for those of you uh, who are interested in, uh, in implementing JASP, uh, there is a source, uh, the, Website, I, I put it on the chat at the beginning of our, our, our seminar. There, uh, as EJ has said, there are tutorials and, and examples, uh, working examples, blogs, and so on. So it's a great uh, resource just to learn. And uh, our lab at Venus University also, are also developing some wikis uh, that can be accessed soon. I, so, I, I would add one more, one more thing that I think is really important. When the university implements sort of the switches to JASP, it, it's not that we have, uh, well, we, we, we probably have fewer analyses than SPSS, but we also have a lot of really important analyses that SPSS completely lacks, right? So there's definitely added value there. And if a, if a teacher says to us, look, I teach this course, there's this particular metric that I, that I use and I teach it and it's not available in JASP, can you please add it? Then we will probably really quickly add it, right? So you actually have the opportunity to mold to the software to your teaching needs instead of doing it the other way around and going like, oh, this is what the software can do. So that kind of determines what I teach. So I do think that that our response, our responsiveness is I think another uh, argument for JASP instead of this big program that, that you can't really connect to the programs. Thanks. So are there, uh, and in the interest, interest of time, uh, are there more questions, remark, quick ones? from the audience, see some teachers here, some uh, even first year students who just learned about JASP yesterday because they will just start their undergraduate studies uh, in a couple of weeks. So nice. they're also great. Nice. Um, yeah, more questions, uh, one quick question or remark. Well then, I think I would like, just like to say thanks for the opportunity and it's great to see so many people interested. And I hope, uh, uh, and I hope you you liked what you saw and you uh, uh, weren't bored. And uh, and I I I for one really liked uh, uh, demonstrating it to you. And thanks for your excellent questions as well. Thanks thanks for being here. Let's uh, spend the whole morning uh, with us all the way in Indonesia. So I think if there are no more questions or remarks, I will conclude this, uh, this seminar. Thank you, EJ, for, for your excellent presentation. And for those of you who have spent time to, to follow the seminar, there is an evaluation. And in the evaluation, I think it's also important for us, there are places for you to give suggestions. Uh, what are the next seminar would be? And if you would like to, to come and join us uh, to organize these seminars as well, you can also uh, put suggestions there and, and put wishes there. Uh, you can find it in the link uh, in the chat. Uh, otherwise, uh, I thank you for all your attendance and participation. And 
I'll see you in our uh, next seminar. Uh, one quick thing is that, so you can see that the JASP is, is uh, also synchronized with OSF. In November, we will have a seminar on the open science framework. So you can also follow that one. If you would like to know more what is this thing, I think Farah, uh, the facilitator for that seminar is also with us today. So that's it for me. And thanks everyone and have a good, uh, Friday morning for, for EJ and good uh, afternoon and happy weekend for all of us in New Year. Thanks for attending everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, EJ. Thanks, EJ. Cheers. Am I still sharing my screen? Yeah, you're still sharing your screen. Yeah, I was wondering about that because I can't <laughs> seem to. Oh, and I'm, I'm just... highlighting. Oh, I'm here, we here we go. Here yeah. we go. Yeah, I'll stop. I'll stop the share. I think. Yeah, and I'm so spotlighting you too. So that's uh, that's why you can't uh, probably couldn't see the, the participants. Well, thanks. There were many people here. It was really uh, yeah. exciting to uh, to to see uh, such uh, such attendance. So that's really yeah. great. And okay. I, I, I saw some remarks that they, they're, they're willing to try JASP and maybe bring it to their institution. So that's, that's oh, always good fantastic. News. Yeah, yeah. Then they can yeah, earn so their more place on more our T-shirts and, uh, yeah. and classes to send to an Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, right. uh, enjoy your weekend. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye. Oke, okay, terima kasih Ibu Bapak semua. Sampai ketemu di acara-acara selanjutnya. Dan apa lagi ya, Cang? Ah, Selamat weekend. Ya, yeah, happy weekend. <laughs> Saya end acaranya dari sini. Selamat sore semua.